Hi, and welcome to the video build log of the Dynam Waco YMF-5. In part one, we dealt with the sub-assemblies and some of the preparation work, and in this part we're going to deal with putting those sub-assemblies onto the main fuselage and finishing up the model to end up with the great model that you see here. So now I have the radio programmed and I've got the receiver installed, got the um, servo centered so the uh, clevises are in the centered position back here when I get to the point of adding the tail. Uh, but there's been a couple other little cosmetic things I've done uh, and a couple that I've got just left to do. One of them is to add the um, uh, back canopy uh, onto the airplane. It just fits very nicely there. Uh, you may have noticed in that section when I talked about glue, I have some canopy glue. It's the Formula 560 canopy glue uh, and I'm going to use that. One of the th things that uh, is good about this canopy glue is that it's, it's flexible and it um, uh, is sticky, firm, it's firm enough, and then the other thing is that it dries clear and so if you slop a little bit on the clear part of your canopy you're able to see through it and you don't notice the the fact that you got a little sloppy so we'll put it on the inside of the canopy on the rails and then it's going to fit along the raised part of the foam right here and so just drop it right on down And I'm just going to sit here and hold it for a couple of minutes. Again, I'm not going to hold it with tape because it's paint around here and I don't want to pull the paint. Now, with the windscreen glued on, I'm going to zoom in on the hatch cover and show you a couple of other little pointers uh, in terms of uh, making this a little bit more functional. One of the things that's not unusual to hear about with models that have the battery hatch on top is that the magnets that hold uh, the hatch on aren't strong enough. I've certainly read those comments about this model in the threads on RC groups. However, a lot of times that's really not the case. It's not that the magnets aren't strong, it's just that the, the magnet pieces and the piece of metal that the magnet connects to here are uh, too far apart. They're not close enough, so when you put the hatch on you really don't hear them click together. And a couple of millimeters is all it takes for that magnet to lose a lot of its ability to uh, hold the piece together. The magnetism dis dissipates rather rapidly. And so with this model I found the same to be true. I could pull the hatch off fairly easily, so I did slight modification. Now these little metal pieces are really just uh, kind of U-shaped pieces, a big flat piece with a couple of forks, one on each end to push them into the foam, and there's a little uh, recess there molded for the foam um, to accept this piece of metal. And these pieces were down below the surface here, and so it made a space, which I thought is probably going to be uh, part of the problem of this not sticking well. So I used a common screwdriver, pried these out, they came out very easily, didn't damage the foam or anything. And then I used some of that polyurethane glue, remember that's the foam that foams, uh, the glue that foams a little bit. And then so I spritz the metal with a little water, put some polyurethane glue here in the pocket and then put the uh, metal pieces back on with a piece of painter's tape over the top, kind of tight, uh, so that as the foam expanded it would push the metal up against the tape and not cause the metal to go higher than the edge but be right flat with the edge. And that's what ended up happening. And so now when I put this on the airplane you can hear it click together and it's really nice and firm. Now the other thing that happens with these battery hatches that uh, are done over the top is that when you're pushing on the hatch to pull it up out of the airplane, you end up making the back corner dirty or crushed. And so what I've done in this case is I had a piece of a five millimeter wide and about a millimeter thick carbon fiber strip. Sometimes I use the epoxy stirring strips like a popsicle stick, but in this model there really wasn't space for that larger wooden piece. And so I used the uh, carbon fiber. I cut it about two or three millimeters wider than this space, and then I just used my hobby knife, and you can see this black line. I carved a, uh, just cut a slit across there, pushed the carbon fiber rod in to spread the foam out, pulled it out, put a couple of drops of CA along there to hold it firm, and then painted the tips of the um, carbon fiber yellow to match the side of the um, 
airplane and then push that in there. And so now what I'm able to do is when this is on, I can reach my hand over the top and I feel just those little tiny uh, tips of that carbon fiber and I can lift on those and pull it out without crushing the foam. Let me bring the rest of the fuselage in here and I'll show you what I mean. So you can see I have the fuselage here. You've got the magnets on the corners on the inside mounted in little uh, plastic receptacles in there. And so now when I take the canopy or the hatch cover here, I can just drop it in place and you can hear it kind of pop. The magnets are really nice and strong because I've got them closer to the magnet itself. And I think you'd have to really look hard to see the little uh, tips of that carbon fiber. But what it allows me to do, instead of pushing on this or pulling on it to get the magnets to release, I just take my fingertips, find the, tip, the tips of that carbon fiber, and just lift it right off. It's really slick and it saves wear and tear on the corners of your hatch with those dirty fingerprints or crushing the foam. So adding the empennage should be a fairly simple process. There are a couple of uh, cups here for the foam pieces on the tail uh, to fit in. And then the other thing you'll notice is that there's a, um, a tab here that's going to go into a slot on the back of the fuselage. Now when I dry fit this, this wouldn't fit very well, so I sanded away some of the paint so you can see it's a little white right here uh, so that it still fits very snug, but uh, it isn't deforming the foam. And so it's just going to be a matter of dropping it in there, guiding that little tab into the slot, and then just carefully pushing it together. So now it's on. The next step will be to flip it over and screw it in on the bottom. Notice I'm not using any glue. Uh, the screws hold the tail on just fine and when it's screwed on like that and not glued, if you happen to have one of those little unfortunate incidents, you can order the spare parts for the tail, just unscrew it and not worry about trying to pry it off and damaging the fuselage. Now the instructions call these um, screws uh, 2.3 by 20 uh, millimeter screws and they're the wood screw type things. They've got a pointy end and then the coarse threads. And so all I'm going to do is uh, drop them into the holes where they are going to fit in the plastic receptacles here on the, vert or on the horizontal stabilizer. And then the kit provided screwdriver is way too short to fit in there so I've got a screwdriver from my workshop and I'm just going to drop it in there help the screw find the uh, hole there we go tighten that baby up again wiggle the screw around feel the screwdriver bite the uh, the Phillips head on the there we go the top of this or in the top of the screw and then screw it in there so the next step here is to attach the uh, clevises to the control horns. Now you remember that we centered the servos with the radio a, a couple of seconds ago and, and so that was so we could get a good adjustment physically on the screw-on clevis heads that are on threaded rods or at least partially threaded. Now to do that I use just a little needle nose pliers and then I hold the rod tight and then twist the clevis either in or out as required. Um, I like to use the needle nose plier so that as I twist, sometimes it gets pretty hard and I don't want to transfer that twisting motion onto the servo in the, uh, uh, the front part of the fuselage. And so I've done that with each of the, the clevises. And so what I like to do then is, is I watch it with the flight controls level and then I get the clevis to the point where um, that pin is going to go through the middle hole when the flight controls are um, parallel to the, the primary flight control, in this case the horizontal stabilizer. Then I just use a common screwdriver with a fairly wide tip to separate the pin and then drop the pin in the hole and see what my alignment is. And if I'm not happy with my alignment then I can just take it off and screw the, uh, the clevis down or out a little bit to make it uh, the alignment that I want. Now the other thing that you notice is that I don't have a clevis down here and uh, in this case 
I noticed that when I unpacked it that the clevis rod or the control rod was bent a little bit and when I started to turn it it broke. Now um, you know I like to think of myself as a modeler not as an assembler so I simply went into the uh, workshop got a piece of music wire the appropriate length measured it clipped it off and put a z-bend on this and so in this case all I'm going to do is uh, bend that z-bend into the hole and so now I've got it connected. Now on the fuselage side, let me slide this down. There was already a quick connector down here and uh, for the tail wheel. And so I again went to the workshop, got a little micro size quick connector that would uh, had a hole that was large enough for the music wire, mounted it where the Z-bend in the uh, uh, servo arm used to be with the broken rod and just popped it in there and tightened it down. So I've got the pins through the control horns from each of the clevises and then as you can see across the back here since these are both separately adjustable um, I've got an ice side on them to make them the same. If you've got your um, elevators a little bit off that may be a reason for kind of a, a roll to the left or the roll to the right that you're messing around with your ailerons uh, when you really uh, have a um, an elevator that's misaligned. So you want to give it a good uh, eyeball to make sure that you've got these two control surfaces uh, matched up. Now the other thing I tend not to do with the plastic clevises is I don't snap them at this point. I just leave them open the pins through the control horns because when I get to the final stage of uh, programming my radio and adding the sub trims and that kind of thing uh, I like to be able to make those adjustments and if I find that I need to um, do a physical adjustment on the on the clevis I'm able to do that without pulling it apart. Again, they're just little plastic pieces and so I don't like to put a lot of stress on the little plastic uh, nub that snaps into the other side of the clevis. And then since we're back here talking about the clevises, when I do finally uh, snap these and I've got them all down, what I like to use is a little uh, small cable tie or zip tie that I'll wrap around the clevis, make the loop and pull it tight to hold those two pieces of the clevis together. Uh, you don't want them coming apart. You know, an aileron might not make a big difference. You can fly with one aileron, uh, although not well, but uh, having the uh, clevis fall off the control horn to the elevator would kind of ruin your day. And so uh, you want to secure these. Another good technique for securing these would be uh, to slide a piece of fuel tubing over this. A lot of guys do that. You just make a sleeve and slide it up over there to hold it tight. And I suppose you could actually use a piece of heat shrink to do uh, the same thing, although you'd want to be careful with not bubbling the foam if you applied some heat uh, to the heat shrink while it's down here over the top of the clevis. So something to keep in mind when you get your final adjustments done so that these things remain secure. Now the last thing that I want to talk about in terms of uh, some modifications you might want to make to the model has to do with airflow through the fuselage to keep the electronics cool. Now this is a solid plate here where these faux cylinders are and there's a channel where the ESC lies underneath the cowl and so what I did is uh, on the bottom couple of areas between the cylinders I used my hobby knife and cut that out. Now in fact probably only the middle one really has much clearance into that channel but by doing so you open up um, you know, a square half an inch or so of air space to go through uh, into the fuselage to keep the battery and the ESC cool. And so that might be worth uh, your consideration. The model has on the bottom a nice large air escape hole down at this side, but it really doesn't have much in terms of input. And so uh, by cutting away a couple of the spaces between the cylinder, you can add some airflow and uh, help keep your electronics cool. Now we've got the wing ready to assemble onto the main part of the fuselage and just a couple things I wanted to point out to you. One you can see here I've got the, the wires from the LEDs all bundled together. I don't plan to use them so I've got them tied down so that they stay out of the way. The other thing is that because I'm using a six channel receiver I used a servo extensions on each of the servos uh, to go to the aileron and to the aux channels so that I can dial in some uh, differential ailerons. If if you're using a four channel receiver or you just don't want to mess with six channels, you'd plug in the Y 
uh, cord into the aileron channel of your receiver and connect them. And then because I don't plan on taking the airplane apart very often, I've used some electrical tape to tape the servo uh, connectors together so they don't come apart. So now it's just a matter of sliding the wing in and pushing it down. We've got three screws that we'll be using, a big screw in the back and two of the smaller um, 2.5 or 2.3 by 20 millimeter uh, screws that fit into plastic receivers here in the front. So let's put them on now. Here's the screw, just going to drop it in there. Feels like it's landed on the receiver. It did, I can feel it grab. And go after the other one. Again, these are plastic receivers in there, and so you want to get the screws tight, but not so tight that you strip them out. So I've got a good grip there. And then I've got the large bolt for the back. And I've got that in the back, and so that's really all there is to attaching the bottom part of the wing. Now the next step in the assembly is to put the front wing supports on and mount them to the fuselage. You'll notice that I've painted the supports yellow to match the rest of the airplane. I found some pictures of this tail number on Google Images and it has yellow supports. And so while some of the glue was drying on some of those other steps, I uh, painted these yellow. It calls for using the sh very short little 2.5 uh, by six millimeter screws and so that's what I'm going to use. Again going into the the plastic receivers you can feel that grab. Now the second one the same way. Got those in there nice and firm but not too tight. Now swing around to the other side and get that support on as well. Now I've got the front supports dialed in here and uh, we're ready to put the top wing on. Now the wing itself is it comes in one piece, it's got the spar, then it's also got wires that came from the LEDs. And again, I'm not planning to use those, uh, but if you do, they kind of follow the support down and there's a little hole uh, in the side of the foam right there that would allow you to push the wires through into the battery compartment right there. Since I didn't want to use the LEDs but I didn't want to clip the wires in case I changed my mind, I have basically just doubled the wires back in the same channel and put a couple of little dollops of hot glue in there to hold them in place and that way I can change my mind at a later date. Now the wings just fit over the top like this and then we'll be using also then the um, the outboard supports and as before I've painted those and they're just going to fit in this case going forward into the little holes using the small uh, six millimeter screws and nuts that came with the kit. Now there's not a lot to see besides me just screwing these little nuts in um, so I'm going to uh, uh, go and do that and I'll show you the result when I'm done. Well it's starting to look like an airplane now. We've got the bottom wing on, we've got the wing supports mounted, and we've got the upper wing attached as well. A couple things I noticed is that you need to size the outboard wing supports because they're not exactly the same and so they do fit a particular way so make sure you get them sized before uh, you start putting in the screws. The other thing is that the, uh, the screws went in pretty easily. There is not a lot of extra length on that screw, but uh, they went on easier than I had anticipated after reading some of the complaints about the shortness of those screws. Uh, when I got those done, I put a little drop of thread locker on the outside of each one. Hopefully it'll uh, seep into the threads and lock those in tight uh, so they don't uh, come apart. Now the upper and lower aileron are connected by these push rods that have 
a Z-bend on one side and a clevis on the other. Uh, before installing them, I matched them up to make sure that they were both exactly the same size. Uh, and I had to twist the one clevis around maybe half a turn to get them to be equal to one another because we don't want the ailerons to have uh, a differential. When you start making the corrections to one, you want the others to match. So we've got the Z-bend on this side. We're just going to push it into the hole, give it a little support or a little push to get it through the hole there and bring it on around. And then as we did before, I have this common screwdriver here. I'm just going to separate the clevis hole and mount it in the hole like that. And this one I am going to just snap together. Just like that. Now as I think I've mentioned before, uh, the Dynam decals are really pretty good. They're usually bright and colorful uh, and they stick really well to the models. The way I put those decals on to keep them from uh, rolling up on themselves is I, I cut the, the decal down really close to the decal itself and then I pull away the extra vinyl that's around the edge so that the only thing that's left is um, the decal itself on the backer paper. And then I peel back the decal and then with my scissors cut off about oh, a quarter or half an inch of the backer board of the backer paper there and then what I'm able to do is I can position the decal exactly the way I want it without it without me worrying about it sticking before I want it to stick and so I want this little flying wing here on the tail just about right there and then I'll push down the sticky part of the decal where I cut away the paper and then just fold the paper back and then run it forward just like that. Now we're just about to the end of our assembly of this uh, uh, Dynam Waco and uh, so the last part we'll be putting on the uh, propeller and so it comes with a friction style uh, collet here it just goes on the end of the shaft coming from the motor it comes with two 12 by 6 uh, propellers and um, the, the, the word dynam and the size of the propeller right here goes out facing forward so you have the propeller on straight. A little plastic washer goes on right there and then it finishes up with this really nice prop nut, uh, big heavy looking thing that uh, will allow you to uh, cinch everything down and um, bind it to the, uh, the shaft on the motor. We'll get it turned down there and then just use a thin screwdriver, put it through the hole and then just cinch it down so it's nice and tight. And now for a couple of closing comments about the Dynam Waco. The Waco was a fun airplane to build. It went together well. The parts fit together well. The fit and finish, paint and all of that uh, was just very nice, very typical of Dynam models. There were a couple of things that I was not happy with uh, and I may have mentioned them during the course of the build. One of course was when the push rod to the rudder broke. Uh, it had been bent during uh, the shipping or manufacturing or packing process and when I straightened it out it broke. So keep in mind uh, those push rods don't have a lot of tolerance for bending. Uh, they're going to snap. Now unfortunately the same thing happened on one of the um, push rods for the ailerons. As I pushed the Z-bend through the top aileron here, it also snapped off, which was a little bit frustrating. But since I had the push rod from the rudder now, with, since I replaced it with a piece of music wire, I was able to use the Z-bend on that, measure it to length, and then put the clevis on the end of that used a little CA and a little epoxy around the edge to hold it firm. And so it wasn't a catastrophe, although it would have been a bit of more of a mess uh, had, that not had not that rudder um, uh, push rod broke as well. Now, the inside the airplane, there's a lot of room for your electronics. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the electronics this time, simply because your radio and what you choose to put in it may change. Uh, I choose to put a six-channel orange receiver in it, which gives me the ability to use aileron differential 
uh, on the ailerons, changing the, the amount it goes up and down. Uh, I also put an external BEC in there, uh, so I have uh, power to the receiver should something happen to the electronic speed control. There's nothing more frustrating than seeing the magic smoke coming from your airplane and knowing that you're just going to watch it crash. So um, I've done that as well and I, I like to do that when some of these larger models especially if I'm using uh, relatively inexpensive uh, electronic speed controls. So all in all, nice model, looks good. I'm anxious to get it out to the field, a little bit more radio programming, and I'll be good to go. Hope you've enjoyed this and that it's been helpful as you enjoy your walkout.